I'll just uh, add a little bit to what uh, Doug has just said. I think you can turn around uh, the scenario that Tom gave us, uh, namely, okay, if people, if neoconservatives are going to say that we're facing an implacable, undeterrable, uh, you know, Muslim enemy, then the question becomes, well, what li constitutional liberties should remain? Why not just get rid of all of them? What what is going to be necessary in order to fight this, you know, undying, uh, unending war against? a foe that is 100% determined and cannot be deterred from trying to kill us. Um, you know, I mean, there are many millions of Muslims who are American citizens. What are you going to do about that? Do you think that the president should have the right to just deprive people of citizenship at a whim? Uh, if you're going to do that, what on earth makes you think that that's going to be restricted just to Muslim citizens? Why wouldn't that be applied to other people? Especially, I mean, there are other groups, uh, you know, uh, certainly the Branch Davidians could tell us a few things about uh, some smaller religious denominations that have uh, fallen afoul of uh, the federal government. So, yeah, I, I think that the nice thing about that hypothetical argument is that it allows us to push the other side, you know, at their weak point as well, and to get them to specify exactly what they have in mind in terms of suspending the Constitution. Now, as far as the implacability of uh, you know, terrorists around the world goes, uh, really the most uh, important study that's been done of this uh, is by a, a professor at the University of Chicago named Robert Pape. Uh, he wrote a book called Dying to Win, which is one of the books that Ron Paul recommended that Rudy Giuliani read after they had their debate. Uh, Robert Pape has studied the phenomenon of uh, suicide uh, bombing, suicide terrorism, uh, more in depth than uh, anyone else has done. And uh, what he has discovered is that, in fact, it is driven primarily by occupation, that primarily it is a phenomenon that is associated with uh, one country having troops, having a military presence in another country. Uh, it actually begins not with Muslims, but with uh, Sri Lanka, which has, uh, you know, India controls Sri Lanka, and uh, the Tamil Tigers, I believe, were some of the first people who began uh, the practice of uh, suicide bombing. Uh, the final thing I would say about this idea of an undeterrable, uh, enemy who is 100% committed while we are sort of weak and wavering and have these constitutional scruples. Well, that is exactly what they said during the Cold War. They said that communists, you know, believe 100% in worldwide domination, that they must believe this because of uh, the Marxist, uh, you know, uh, Leninist dialectic, that this is their faith and that they will do anything necessary in order to uh, achieve this. And yet we were able to defeat the communist, the Soviet menace, uh, not by going to war with the Soviet Union, which would have triggered a nuclear, nuclear holocaust uh, that would have killed you know, millions of people, if not destroyed civilization altogether. Uh, we did it by simply uh, you know, letting their economic system fall apart. And in fact, you'll see that throughout the uh, Islamic world, they're suffering from many of the same sorts of problems uh, on, in different levels uh, that the Soviet Union uh, suffered from. So there are a great, uh, if anything, what people don't understand is that the, the largest segment of hostility and revolutionary violence in the Islamic world is directed towards other Islamic regimes. That fundamentally, Al-Qaeda is even more concerned about what happens in Riyadh than they are with what happens in the United States. They want to create a caliphate in the Islamic world long before they create one here. And what we've actually seen is that when you do create a uh, theocratic government, uh, which is what Iran has had for a very long time, you also create a resistance. Because human beings do not like being ruled by that kind of totalitarian system. Uh, that's why, for example, the Taliban had nothing to lose in 2001 because they were on the verge of starting to have a civil war right there in Afghanistan already because all the uh, impositions uh, that the Taliban had made upon ordinary Afghans were so burdensome that the resistance, that the anti-Taliban forces within Afghanistan already were getting more and more power and were going to topple the, the, uh, the Taliban. Uh, you see that in Iran. Last year, Iran had an election and you had massive protests. You had, uh, you know, people really risking their lives to go out on the streets to say that they wanted to get rid of uh, some of the, uh, the worst uh, nationalists and, and the worst mullahs who were ruling the country. Now, it's not that they wanted to create a liberal democracy on American style. That's not what the Iranian reformers wanted. They wanted a milder form of uh, Iranian uh, sort of theocratic government. But nevertheless, it goes to show that when, when these people actually gain control of a country, that's not the end of the story. That doesn't mean that they've suddenly gained a great deal of power. In a way, it actually makes them weaker than before because now they have to deal with the revolutionaries who want to overthrow them. So in fact, this idea that we're facing an implacable enemy, I think Robert Pape has refuted that, and I think the record of uh, the Cold War and uh, the myth that we were told that the communists were equally undeterrable uh, has proved the falsehood of that as well. Uh, Tom, could I have... Oh, please. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say we know what kind of liberties those neocons would give up because they are complacent, not just the neocons, but the so-called progressives. 
with endowing the president with authority to order the assassination of an American citizen that the president unilaterally says is creating an imminent constant danger to the United States with no checks whatsoever. Is that different than Vladimir Putin sending plutonium, plutonium 211 to Litvinenko in London and having him die? No checks, no accountability, nothing. The president says, you're creating a danger, we can rub you out. That's the kind of liberty they're willing to give up. Well, I, first of all, I th these were really great answers. I, I hope you don't mind that I asked that question and took all our question time. But we, we have a few minutes left. If anybody would like to come to one of these microphones, we could maybe get a question or two in. Uh, y yes? Oh, is, she, is it not functioning? Let's see, are there any others? Oh, is there a, is there a switch? Well, I'm very high tech here. <laughs> Be very low tech and just yell your question if necessary. Megaphone. There we go. Uh, Vincent Campos of uh, Potawatomi County. In the Constitution, Article One, Section Eight, where it says, uh, and "This is the Bruce Feen." Uh, can you explain what it means in the history of where it says, "Grant letters of mark and reprisal"? Okay. Yeah. Who'd like to take that? Well. Um, Congress has authority to authorize privateers to go and capture foreign, trip, foreign um, uh, ships and to sell them and to obtain part of the booty. It was something that was important at the outset when we didn't have the mammoth military establishment that we have today. Uh, now it's sort of fallen into desuetude. The more important power of Congress is the exclusive power and responsibility to declare, decide to initiate war. Every single founding father, even those who are in favor of a muscular president, the Alexander Hamilton, at best described the commander in chief power as no more than being head of the army and the navy, little more than a governor enjoyed in heading the national or a state militia, and distinctly describing the president's commander in chief powers as vastly inferior to that of the British monarch. Now the commander in chief power is said to have gobbled up every other provision in the United States Constitution, one of the most flagrant denials or repudiations of original intent that Justice Antonin Scalia and the conservatives at one time championed. 